So let's look up to the path to the cross, starting from John chapter 17. If you look at John chapter 19, verse 17, John chapter 19, verse 17, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is, Aramaic is called Golgotha. Okay. Now, if you look at uh, the recording of John, how can he write this much only, right? He went out bearing his own cross to the place and uh, to the place called Golgotha. If last Sunday or in the previous Sunday, I think I mentioned, John did not record the prayer at Gethsemane. He didn't want to relive again all the sufferings of the Lord. Here also, he didn't mention how he suffered along the way. So is this story over? Shall we go back? <laughs> no, because he felt that when we survey New Testament, we found that he's most likely the one who writes the last. Mark would have been the first. Matthew and Luke, they record much, much more in detail, so we believe that they record after Mark. And by the time of John, some of the events, he said, not necessary to, not necessary to repeat. Okay, so he just wrote it like that. How can he write? It's just a, a single sentence. The things, the, all the torture that have happened. Why would he do this? The thing is, he could not, you know, go again and relive all the suffering the Lord had gone through. You know, he really loved the Lord. He didn't want to mention those things because it's already written. This is our understanding and way of looking at it, right? The Bible doesn't tell us, right? We have to interpret his life. You know very well the crucifixion is the cruelest form of punishment, the cruelest and most miserable form of execution invented by men. Most people believe that it was not the Romans who invented this. It was the Persian. By the time Romans started using, imitating the Persian, they perfected it. So that they really know how to torture a Persian. Okay? So that is what the Lord is going to on this day. And they placed to a place called Golgotha. What is Golgotha? It is a place of skull. It is a place of curse. It is a place where criminals are finally given their rituals. Okay? So Golgotha is not a you know, honorable place. So they were, they were forced to walk along this, the path all the way outside the city. By the time they reached that place, everyone would have seen who has been condemned. Every, they want to know that these people have been condemned. They want to make an example out of these people who are going to be crucified. So you are dread. I will never do any crime deserving this kind of punishment. It's not only for the person who is suffering, more so for the family and friends. So this is not only, you know, pain and suffering, physical pain and suffering, but it is a culture which is deeply rooted in honor and shame culture. So they want to shame him and his entire family throughout this journey so that totally they are humiliated, embarrassed, and in that way, let me put it this way, dishonored. No honor, nothing is given accorded to such people who died like that. They will flog them, they will spit on them, they will do all sorts of things, and finally, they will crucify them. So if we look at John, there is nothing more to say, because they, he said they took him there. Along the way, what happened? He didn't say anything. Then at least let's go to a little bit to Matthew and others, right? If, if we read John, then it's over, you know? <laughs> we need to go back now, even... Not even five minutes passed, right? Let's go to Matthew. What does Matthew tell us? Matthew tells us that uh, Matthew chapter 27, verse 27. 
Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered a whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mock him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. So the soldiers, they stripped the Lord and put on a scarlet robe on him, basically to show that this man has been cursed. And a crown of thorn was put on him as well. They mock at him. They spit. See, crucifixion alone, if you had to be uh, crucified, find, you take finally and you, uh, suddenly you take to the Golgotha and you crucify, that will not be that's that much, you know. Uh, of course, there will be pain, but that will not, that, will, that is something somehow bearable. But here, what they will do is, they will put all kinds of things that can strip off his honor and dignity. Okay? So, they spit on him. They, they say, hey, hail king of the Jews. This is actually mocking, right? And then they made fun of him. Does the scripture say, as they went out, verse 32, of, they found a man of Syrian, Simon by name. They compelled him, this man, to carry his cross. Okay? You may be reading in different version. I am mostly reading in the, uh, okay, reading in the uh, ESV. As they went out, they found a man from Syrian. Okay. Lord Jesus, he, the way they let him carry, now you can imagine, he could not even carry his own cross anymore properly because of the flogging. What they did was, if you watch the Passion of the Christ movie, you can understand to some extent what kind of torture had happened. I could not watch. I, I watched for a few minutes and then I closed my eyes until they finished, you know. It was too graphic. True, you know, uh, painful to watch. I, I think the words are not enough. Excruciating pain, this word is not enough to even describe. Words are not enough to describe the pain they inflicted on Lord Jesus. So what happened? He could not even carry his own cross. A grown-up man usually is able to carry their cross. He could not carry this. So they found a man so from Syrian, Simon. Why nay, uh, his name came out like this? If we study God so properly only, you can feel the grace within this person. In fact, Simon had come from Syrian, which is northern part of uh, Egypt, uh, Africa, most likely somewhere in Egypt today. He also had come to the Jewish Passover festival, to attend the Passover festival, to have a quiet, beautiful, religious experience, spiritual experience, and go back. He never expected to carry this kind of con a condemned you know, cross. But somehow, he, will, he is forced to carry. Later on, he must be feeling very graceful, you know? Later on, later on, not now. Many times, the grace of God is given to you. You don't even know. You don't, you don't even feel graceful. Okay. But later on, if you can understand, you'll find, ah, God is so good. He has selected me. He has called me. He has, you know, captured me. Out of all these friends and everybody, God has chosen me. Amen? You'll understand later. Why? How? Mark... <clears throat> chapter 15, verse 21, and they compel a pastor by Simon of Syrian, who is coming from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. So, I like Mark because he described more about Simon. 
You know why? Who is Simon? Simon is the father of Alexander and Rufus. Okay? <laughs> now, Rufus' name comes in romance. Okay. Look at Romans chapter 16, verse 13. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Okay. What is Paul talking about? All live around the same time as Lord Jesus, actually, right? Not too much different. Now, what is happening? Of course, a little bit later, Simon has sons, grown-up adult, by the name of Alexander and Rufus. With the testimony of Simon, okay, Rufus and Alexander, probably the household became believers. And Rufus especially become involved in the ministry of God. Amen? So Simon was suffering, carrying, helping the cross of Lord Jesus. He didn't expect that. He didn't expect these things to happen to him. But it just happened. Later on, he felt so graceful. This is our interpretation, right? He felt so graceful that he witnessed to his children. The grace of the Lord, when understood, you always want to witness to the people around you. Your brother, your sister, you know, mother, father, you know, siblings, and so on. So, look at a beautiful history being opened. Even the unexpected Simon from Syria has been blessed like this. So that he's now, his entire generation is blessed. Because they have come to know the saving work of Lord Jesus. Amen. So when we look at the Bible, it is indeed amazing. And how, how touching this scene is. Unknowingly, Simon has been blessed like this. In other words, God is choosing uh, to reveal his grace to Simon. Today, if you are here and you are wondering, oh, why am I here? No, maybe God chose you so that you and your generations can be blessed to the saving work of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? In fact, he has to carry the cross. It was kind of symbol. Lord Jesus, later on, he said to disciples, anyone who wants to be my disciples must take up their cross and follow me. Matthew 16, 24, right? So, Simon is the first person to carry the cross of Lord Jesus. <laughs> how, how grateful he must have felt later on, right? He never thought that he will be participating in this greater work. He came to witness the Passover festival of the Jews, quietly unnamed person, but the Lord has chosen this person unexpectedly. So Matthew continues to write, verse 33, And when they came to a place called Kokota, which means a place of skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gold. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. Okay. A wine mixed with gold is a anesthetic. It's like painkiller, pain reliever. Who would have brought this kind of painkiller? It is the women. Okay. The women have come here. No man was there except John, the young guy. Everyone had run away, you know, right? So these are normal, but Lord Jesus didn't want to take it. He denied it. He refused it. Why? He's taking all the pain. All the, all the pain completely to himself. The pain of the cross, the Lord did not avoid. He took everything. You now for us, we can suffer for ministry, we can suffer for the Lord if it is convenient. Okay? But to, after some time, this is too much. We may say like this, right? Oh, this is too much. This is too much sacrifice. This is too much work in ministry. But for the Lord, he could take it, but he will not take it. He will not take it at all. The one who was multiplying the wine in the wedding banquet, right? He will not take it. He could be relieved, 
this way. So there are some rich women who have come to Christ as well, who have become his disciples. So how horrible, initially Simon would have felt how horrible to carry a condemned cross. But later on, he felt so graceful. And things like this, even though they offer something to relieve the pain, the Lord will not take those. Now imagine you are carrying the cross and they didn't feel any sympathy towards this someone who is carrying the cross. On top of that, they, they keep on beating him, you know. Flogging is the right word. <laughs> the kind of flogging they do in the Passion of Christ movie, you can see that, you know, at the, at the tip of the, uh, you know, uh, things they use for flogging, there is uh, small, small pieces of iron, sharp iron, right? And that will tear all the flesh, but it will not reach the vital organs because they did from behind. So it is inflicting maximum pain, but it cannot die there, okay? This is the kind of pain they inflicted on Lord Jesus throughout the way, but he was carrying the Lord carried this cross. Matthew didn't want to miss this out. Now why you may be wondering why Matthew is so much after this suffering Lord. Matthew, as you know, is a gospel writer that is aiming to the Jews, right? For the Jews, it is very important to relate Lord Jesus to a lamb that was sacrificed on the Passover, in the Passover. So and then that's why John said in verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Matthew wanted to tell us that Jesus is the one who takes away the sins of the world by sacrificing his life. Amen? He's sacrificing his life so that Matthew doesn't want to miss out the, the, the blood that, he's, that is oozing out, the suffering that is coming out, the, the suffering that is inflicted on his body. He doesn't want to miss out. In other words, his suffering represented his love for us. That is what Matthew wanted to tell us. He said that he is pouring out his life for us. He could get a little bit of relief but he would not want, he didn't want to do that also. Completely, he emptied. Completely, he took all the pain and the pressure thrown at him. So, the Lord took all the sins of the world. This was the life of the Lord. He took upon his body the whole burden of the world. That's why Satan said, this is, in, if you uh, watch the Passion of the Christ movie, this is too hard. You cannot do it, right? No one could do it. But the Lord, he took all the pain, he took all the sufferings that come along the path to the cross. He said in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So he said he didn't come to be served, but to serve. So what is the path of the cross? The path of the cross is serving others, living for others. No, we shouldn't become a Christian who is so self-centered and narcissist drawing everything to ourselves and don't want to serve, you don't want to give anything. No, 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 that's not the life of the cross. If we are a baby believer, we may want like that. But even, even after a person is already grown up, if they are always asking for to be fed by their parents, that is funny, isn't it? When we are a baby, it's okay, they feed us. But as you grow, you are started thinking, how can I also serve? How can I also give? How can I also do something for my family? 
That is natural. In faith also, it is the same. When we are very young, in faith, immature, we will just want to receive everything. But if you want to remain there forever, who can help you, right? But who wants to remain there? Everyone wants to grow. He said, he's, what is, he said, he gave his life as a ransom for many. Okay, what is this idea of ransom? Ransom here, idea is redemption, right? Redemption, the word redemption is not a biblical word, actually. It is a commercial word. So what is this commercial word? It is that you go and purchase, you go and redeem a person with something. In this case, Lord Jesus is redeeming us to the costliest thing. What is that? His own life, his own blood. He's rescuing us. So likewise, the life of the Lord, the life of the Lord was a life given as a ransom because we have been sold to what? As slaves. So redemption is in the market, slaves are sold. If you want to redeem the person, you go and pay for it. Okay? And you redeem the slave. That is exactly what Lord Jesus is doing for, not just for one or two, but entire humankind. So likewise, this is very important. Listening is one thing, putting, in, putting it into practice is another thing. So there are so many believers today who just wants to receive, who just wants to listen, but who doesn't want to put into practice. We must not become those kind of believers. So the path of the cross that the Lord had taken was the, the path that defeated death with death. People want to avoid death, but the Lord defeated death with death. He gave his life completely. So all the arrows of hatred and anger, hate, hatred and sin thrown at him, he swallowed it all. He took it, everything. Therefore, the cross was a great victory. The cross was great strength of the Lord. It may look like he's very weak. No, no, no. That cannot be taken by anybody. They would have given up immediately. But the Lord is still going strong. Amen? I share with you testimony of one brother who, who came from a non-Christian background. The person of the Christ movie was released. So his mom is a non-believer. His dad is a non-believer. He really wanted to take his mom to watch the Passion of the Christ movie. He's, he said, when he told me, I said, no, that's not a good movie to start with, you know. <laughs> Too much violent and Lord Jesus looked defeated there, you know. If they don't understand, Lord Jesus is totally ridiculed and, you know, defeated. <sighs> but it is the truth. Okay, let Look, go and watch, it will be fine, yeah? We are praying. They go and they went and watched the Passion of the Christ movie. After watching, the mother told his son, I want you to be like Jesus, amen? Actually, in that movie, the Lord Jesus is bruised and, you know, speed and one eye is already so much swollen that he cannot even see, he's closed. It looks like he's totally defeated. But if you watch carefully, there was so strength. Pilate said, I can release you with one word. Just say one word. I can release you. Don't you know that I have authority? He said, you don't have authority except the authority given by above. Amen? He said, anyone who is on the side of the truth listens to me. So Pilate was like, what is the truth? <laughs> he wants to know what is the truth. In other words, Jesus is the truth. Amen? There is no more answer needed to be given. The curtain closed. Because Lord Jesus, if he say a word, he will be released. Then we will not be saved. So, there was so much strength. Even though they spit at him, there was strength. If you watch carefully the life of Lord Jesus, this is 
the most courageous life. This is the bravest life. This is the most courageous, strongest life. Where can we see in the most cruelest punishment? When they brought that, you can see the strength of a man. Everyone run away. Peter will say, hey, Lord, I'll die for you. I'll die with you. Huh? He's not here. In, when he reached Kolkata, Peter was not there. And what he did, wh why Lord Jesus is so disfigured? Why he is doing all this? Why he cannot say anything? Why he could not open his mouth? Because this is exactly what happened. Surprisingly, the on Passover, right? During the Passover festival, this is happening. People like Simon, they felt so graceful when they go back, you know. <laughs> Northern Africa, Alexandria, the city of Alexandria became the center of Christianity in the first century because of people like Simon and many other people. How did, because, because they testified this crucified Lord, they saw it firsthand. They saw him carrying. They thought that was a criminal. Later on, they realized that you know, a criminal and him, the face is different. There was no nervousness in his face. There is no guilty feeling in his face. There was confidence. Can you be confident in the face of trials and persecution and suffering? It's Lord Jesus, the strength of a man who was doing something for humanity. Because every Jew understands that it is Leviticus. Leviticus is, Leviticus is happening. In Leviticus chapter 16, and Aaron shall lay both hands on the head of the life good and confess it all the iniquities means sins okay transgressions and iniquities you come across in the bible continuously transgression is what it is willful sin knowingly doing things okay what about iniquities iniquities is doing it continuously both are sin way of describing sin but there is specific meaning to it so the iniquity of all the people, the sins of all the people of Israel, and their transgressions, willful sin and continuous sin, that's what we all of us does, does, right? Sometimes we do it willfully, many other times not willfully, we continually do it, right? And he shall put them on the head of a goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in Readiness, the goats shall be shall bear, shall, bear, shall bear all their iniquities on itself and on a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. You may say, Oh, they release the goat in the wilderness. Oh, no, good thing. No, 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 it's not good thing. Goat is not a wild animal, it's a domestic animal. You cannot release in the wilderness. Maybe here it's a little bit different, but if you go into Judean wilderness, that's where lions and all those predators live. They will tear the goat into pieces immediately. All the angry predators are waiting in the wilderness. So the shepherds have to always guard their sheep, right? So what is this called scapegoat? The, the death of Lord Jesus is nothing but scapegoat, the death of the Lamb of God, the scapegoat, to whom all the, he is carrying all the sins, the life goat is carrying all the sins of Israel, they confess all the sins, lay their hands on it, and release him to the wilderness to be devoured by wild animals and predators. And this is the path that the Lord had walked. His life is totally vulnerable. On this day, there is no protection from the Lord. He is the beloved Son of God. He always has the protection. The Lord will give him miracles, everything. But on this day, he, the Lord, God the Father, could not do anything 
because he also loves us so much. He loves us so much that he let his son suffer. Have you done like that? People, we don't want to do. We don't want to let our loved ones suffer for the sake of others, right? But God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. John 3.16, right? He gave, he loved so much that he gave. So this is the path the Lord had taken, uh, the path of a scapegoat. He is carrying the sins of the whole world. Look, the Lamb of God, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That is the life of Lord Jesus right now, as we are seeing here. Later on, it became a testimony for the believers as well. Paul said, bear one another's burden and in this way fulfill the law of Christ. Believers are also to bear one another's burden and fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is what? It is always carrying the burden of others. It is always carrying, loving, you know, embracing the pain and suffering of others. For, for their sake, let me suffer. For their sake, let me go hungry. For their sake, let me sacrifice this. But what about believers today? Believers today are like, I want more, I want more. Even if, if we even take the share of others, right? That's not Christianity, you know? We cannot have a beautiful community of Christ without Christ life embedded within us. So today, so many Christians, you know, we don't beloved the true body of Christ, I'm telling you. That's why we need to go back to the scripture. So this cross, the suffering of the cross, if one we understand the suffering of the Lord on the path to the cross, it can pierce our heart. It always judges our sinfulness, not wanting to humble, not wanting to sacrifice, not wanting to suffer. Just want to receive, you just want to, you know, get only blessings and blessings. This, it really judges us. The Lord showed this amazing life of redemption to his own body. So he showed us the right path that believers should take. And following this path, you will live. Amen? This is a life of a mature believers. Mature believers, who, the, the way of a mature believer is always the way of the cross. Amen? Baby believers, they never walk the path of cross. What if the Lord comes and finally say, I never knew you. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we, did we not drive out demons in your name? I never knew you. You never walked the path of the cross. You only did things in my name. What if he says that, right? That is because you only look at the blessings and you don't look at the suffering of the Lord. You only look at one side, the love of God, and you forget the wrath of God. That's very dangerous, right? That's a judgment. That's the day of judgment, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, the day of judgment. What, where will we stand? Where can we stand on the day of judgment? Only one side? Okay, there will be a problem. We have to understand. So the path, the, the wrath of God, where it was revealed? It was on the cross. Lord Jesus he, if, if possible, he could save us. But it's not possible to save us without getting the wrath of God. Very, very important. So, in fact, this is the place where Lord Jesus crucified was called Golgotha. In Hebrew, in Latin, it's called Calvary, right? Calvary, you know, we are singing, right? But do we really understand? Many a times, so many new uh, worship songs, Calvary, and it's just very graceful, right? But you don't, you don't even want to suffer even one bit, and you say, Calvary? <laughs> it's really annoying, right? If you understand properly. Calvary is not a place of uh, you know, joy. It's a place where the Lord suffered, paid the price of sins. But we don't want to do anything, and you say, Calvary, and you know? It's like, 
However, Calvary is a very beautiful word. We should have some churches, local churches, named after Calvary. Why? It is such a graceful name. However, it is skull. <laughs> the name is skull, Calvary. If it is color, it will be black. So that's why when we do communion, many times, most many churches, do we still wear black, something dark black, to remember Calvary. The Lord overcame the, the death value of, you know, overcame the value of the death. He overcame that. The dark value of the skull, he overcame it. He defeated all darkness. He defeated anything that comes away, comes the way of the cross, the cross of suffering. He overcame everything. So there are two things that really tell us about, two passages that really tell us about the suffering of the Lord. One is, we read Leviticus. Second one is Isaiah chapter 53. In Isaiah chapter 53, he said, For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. So following Lord Jesus, he said, he has no majesty, he doesn't have beauty, there is that sh it should attract us, that should attract us. He has no beauty or form that sh we should desire him. His appearance is very lowly. That's what the point Lord, uh, Isaiah is telling us. So Isaiah tells us about the suffering servant. The people don't understand this suffering servant. We will be surprised. Salvation only comes to this person who died for us and suffered for us. There is no other way. Verse 2. He grew up before him like a young plant. Well, verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrow. Yet we esteem him not stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crucified for our iniquities. You may be reading in NIV. I'm reading in ESV, okay? But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. And NIV will say, and by his wounds we are healed. Okay. One and the same thing. He was pierced for our transgressions. What is pierced for transgressions? We not only sin one time, right? Continually we sin. He was pierced for that. He was he was pierced for pierced for pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Sorry, transgression is willful sin. He was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Continuous sin, he was crushed. Meaning every possible sin you can mention, he already paid, paid it on the cross. Amen? That is what he did. So the suffering servant, it was prophesied that this suffering servant is the one upon him was the chastisement. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, right? The punishment needed for us to be in peace with God because we don't have peace with God anymore by our sins. It was laid on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. The Lord was pierced, crushed, chastised, and wounded for us sinners and we all like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way and the lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all the iniquity the sins of all of us continuous sin he had laid in on the lord so that means by believing in his name we can have life anyone anyone 
He already paid the price for our sins. Anyone who would believe in his name will have eternal life. Amen? So this is something, so no, pastor, I wish somebody died for me, not Jesus. Okay, they can die for you, no problem. But it will not satisfy the righteous requirement of God, righteous requirement of the law. That only a lamb without blemish should, shed, should die for us. There is no lamb without blemish. All men are born and stained in sins, except Lord Jesus Christ, because he was not born of mankind. He was born of God. Amen. He was a sinless person. So like a lamb that is led to be slaughtered, verse 7, he was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he did not, yet he opened not his mouth. And NIV say, yet he did not open his mouth. ESV, we are rolling up and say, oh, he opened not his mouth. Okay, same. He could open his mouth and escape the suffering. He didn't open his mouth. Many a times, when you really love people, you can say, you know, how right you are, how righteous you are, but you didn't open your mouth because you want to save another person. Amen? But many of us, we want to say everything. You are right, but you also condemn another person. Many a times when we condemn others, it's not like they, we are wrong, we are right. That is a very righteous religious life, Parisic life. Pharisees say seemingly they are right, but they don't think about saving another person. They came and brought Lord Jesus to Pilate, the governor's house. They're standing outside. They didn't even want to enter. Read carefully, okay, your Bible. Because they don't want to defile themselves by entering into a Gentile house compound. But Jesus, they push him. No problem. <laughs> right? No. If Jesus is really a sinner, they, they, would, they would have care. Oh, this man, we, we, we should not push him here. Let's help him to cleanse. They will not do that. They didn't care for that. The path the Lord took was patiently, patiently he took the path. So, what is the path of the cross? It is the path of taking up our griefs and all our transgressions and iniquities. He took upon himself. That is the part of the cross. So no one can say, oh, there may be a lot, many, many paths to, to the cross. There is no many paths to the cross. There is no many paths to God. There is only one way, Jesus Christ. This is not a joke. Some people say, there are so many ways to God the Father. No, only one way, the way of the cross. The way of the cross, this is the only way to the Father. Lord Jesus went and rescued us, redeemed us, purchased us from the slave market of sin. He purchased us and redeemed us. The Son of God who had no sin, they condemned him like a sinner. If we look at the sacrifice of a son, what reminds you? Abraham, right? Abraham also sacrificed his son, literally. And in that suffering, in the sacrifice, Abraham took his son. And then his son suddenly asked, Father, the fire and the wood are here, but what is the burnt offering? That was a very difficult question, right? If you are not prepared, difficult to answer, you know? He said, you. No, he cannot say that, right? <laughs> The Lord will provide. Amen. That was answer of faith. And the Lord is the one who gave Isaac. If we really understand that everything belongs to God, you can sacrifice everything. But since you felt that something belongs to you, you cannot sacrifice. My study, my wealth, my fame, my name, if I think everything belongs to God, I can sacrifice everything. But people, you know, they want to give a little bit to God, everything they want to have for themselves. But think about it. Will there be people who really want to sacrifice everything for the Lord? People like Abraham say, hey, you are the one, literally, you, know, you are the one. In his heart, he knew he's sacrificing his son. How about you? What have you sacrificed for the Lord? Are you giving the leftover a little bit? Or you say, Lord, 
my name, my fame, my, my job, my wealth, everything, take it. Can we say that? You are my first love. I love you the most. Can we say that? Take everything. When Lord Jesus went to the cross, in fact, Isaac doesn't know that he is going to be sacrificed. But Lord Jesus knew everything, but still he went obediently. So Isaac is only a prototype, not like Jesus, right? Only a type. We cannot compare him to Jesus, but a type. Obediently, without knowing, he went. Lord Jesus, knowingly, he went. How about you and me? Can we, know, can we also go? No, you are not going to be the first person. Lord Jesus already walked. Abraham already walked. Many men of God in the Bible, and even today, there are many people who have gone there. How could Abraham overcome this kind of challenge and test? How could Abraham overcome and say, I will give you my best, I will sacrifice my Isaac? But what is this? How to overcome this tragedy? It is faith. When you have faith, everything is possible. When you have faith, you can do everything. Well, now I'm discussing with uh, some members sometimes. How can the person who is from non-Christian background, how can the person come out <laughs> and serve the Lord? Impossible. <laughs> Only if that person has faith, it's possible. Amen? If we have faith, it's possible. If we don't have faith, nothing is possible. There will be so many excuses. Oh, my mom, my dad, my family, this and that. But a person of faith, hey, it doesn't matter. We, I will go for the Lord. Amen? And those are the people who are writing new history of faith everywhere, anywhere. We want to be those kind of people of faith. Amen? We are not the people who say, the sermon should not be more than 30 minutes. No, no, we are not those kind of people. We, are saying, we want to study God's word. We want to feast in the word of God. Retreat like this, Good Friday like this, we should feast the word of God. Why? Then we can understand a little bit of heart of God, a little bit of the heart of God. So the Lord knowingly, he went to the Golgotha. Uh, incomparably, a greater tragedy, pain and suffering. He saw everything he, as a divine being. We say Jesus has two natures, right? Fully man, fully God. Hypostatic union, right? Fully God, fully man. He can see as fully man, but he doesn't want to exercise his fully God nature in him. He just walks as fully man and he suffers. Some of our friends sometimes say, hey, you're God. Jesus is God, right? Yes. So he's pretending that he's suffering. He cannot feel any pain. They told us like this. No, no, no. That's not biblical teaching. He abandoned his kingship in heaven. He had left that thing and emptied fully. So he did not consider himself equal with God. He took up the nature of a servant and obeyed to the point of death, even death on the cross. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, right? 311. Therefore, God exalted him. He emptied himself. He didn't consider himself a call with God the Father. He knew it, but he also knew that he did this with absolute faith that God never abandoned him, even when it looks like he is abandoning him also. He has that faith. Meaning, we can go as far, we, our relationship will not be severe, will not be, never, never be cut off if we understand that the Lord loves us. Who is here in the cross? John only is there. <laughs> Everyone fl flew. Everyone flee. Only John. Because John is what? Disciple of love. He himself testified, whom Jesus loved. He felt that he, he is really loved by Jesus. If you really know that Jesus really loves you, you cannot be separated by anything. Amen? Paul said, who can separate us from the love of Christ, the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? Nothing. Those who understand, they are always there. So, 
uh, John tells us that they go to Golgotha, Golgotha, and verse 18, they crucified him, and with him are two others, one on the either, either side, Jesus between, be, Jesus between them. Two people were crucified with him, right? And verse 19, Pilate, who wrote an inscription and put it on the cross, it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. Amen? Some of you may say, oh, I think now it's uh, 30 minutes is gone, you know? <laughs> Let's finish. But Harry, is it not, isn't it interesting? Very, very interesting. Why this uh, three things is coming, Aramaic, Latin, and Greek? Why these three things are coming when they crucify Lord Jesus, when they put in the three, three languages? This is very, very important, okay? Why? Jesus is the king of the Jews. Declaration is important. First of all, everyone accepts that Lord Jesus is a prophet, right? Lord Jesus is a prophet. This is accepted by everyone. What about he is a king? He, whether he is a priest or king, that is to be established. So he entered the, the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday as a king. There is no official recognition. Pilate is an official person, right? Somehow on his dad, he wrote it. They complain, how can you write like this? I have written what I have written. What is Aramaic, what is Latin, and what is Greek? There are the symbols of the languages spoken by three most advanced cities of that time. What is the most advanced city in terms of religious center in the world at that time? Jerusalem. What language they speak? Aramaic. What about Latin? Latin is spoken by Romans. They are the people who rule the political world. And what about Greek? Greek is spoken by the Greek people. They are the education, learning, philosophy. So religious, political, and so, uh, education, all these three things, all the wise religious influenced people know that Jesus is king. Amen? Know that Jesus is king. That's, it. That's the conclusion. That's why I cannot conclude my sermon, you know, immediately, okay? Because it's very important for you also to know that Jesus is not only for the religious people. Jesus is not only for, you know, the academic people. Jesus is not only for the political people. He's for everybody. Know everyone. Please know that it is for all of you, Aramaic-speaking people, Latin-speaking people, and the Greek-speaking people. They protested, obviously. Why oh, you shouldn't write? This is a criminal. No, we crucify him because you say that this is a king. That's why we have to write Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Why this king of the Jews is important? Because a Messiah, the anointed one, the savior of the world, is supposed to be the king of the Jews. Amen? We are learning about, that's why I say, Jewishness is important. The Bible is about just to be viewed from Jewish eyes. So when it is king of the Jews, why Jesus, king of the Jews, is important? He is the Messiah, the savior of the world. So then, also, really, really important thing that we have is that four women are there. If you read carefully, there are four women. Okay. Why there are four women? This is transitioning of the era. Women are not respected. Women are not honored at those days. Jesus selected four disciples first, if you remember, right? Peter and Andrew, James and John. They are not with him on the cross. However, four women are there. What is happening? It was changing of the time. Transitioning of the time. Jesus involving men and women to his ministries. They are the people who understood the love of Lord Jesus more than any, anybody else. And on the cross, Salome's name is there. Mary Magdalene. Mary, the mother of Jesus, right? And there is one 
lady by the name of Salome, Salome. She is the mother of James, sons of Zebedee, James and John. She was the one who, were, who was requesting, let one of my sons sit on the left, one on my right. At that time, what did Lord Jesus say? You don't know. Can you take the cup I'm going to take? He said, yes, we can drink the cup you're going to drink. Lord Jesus said, you may be able to do so, but to sit on the left and right is to be decided by my father. They were fighting for honor and place. Now it's like when Salome came here to the feet of the cross, it's like she's being taught. Where is the glory? Glory is here on the cross. Lord Jesus is teaching her practically. That's why when we look at this crucifixion of Lord Jesus, I'll go to the ending part, okay? For me, if when I look at this, finally Lord Jesus was saying that it is finished. What was finished? All the pain, all the suffering Lord Jesus went through, finally he accomplished. How can you say that it is finished when you are on the cross? Actually, it looks like you have been defeated, right? On the cross, the Lord is saying, it is finished. What kind of finishing is this? We really love this, uh, you know, in the Greek language, the telestai, right? That we you always hear the telestai. It is finished, accomplished. What did he accomplish? Saving of others. His body is broken. His body is dis. In fact, they were even uh, discussing. Four soldiers are discussing how to distribute his garments. Five pieces are there. There are four people. Each get one each. Only one was left. His inner garment which is made of linen. Linen stands for priests. Lord Jesus when he sacrificed on the cross he was wearing linen. What does it mean? Royal at the same time priest. The priest is now sacrificing his own body on the cross. Now what is happening? King is already confirmed. Priest is confirmed by his sacrifice. He priests usually sacrifice something for others. They bring animal. But on this day, this priest sacrificed his own body. So, so what did Lord Jesus accomplish on the cross? Two things. Prophets was already accomplished earlier. They accept him as prophet. He accomplishes pr priest and king on the cross. That means he is the Messiah the people have been waiting for. You don't need to look for another savior. He finished, he accomplished completely. In fact, uh, Luke recorded that he also cried out, My father, my father, why have you forsaken me? These are the last few say saying of Lord Jesus, seven sayings of Jesus on the cross and not like that. You come across, right? But what was that? It's that on the cross, it's like the father has forsaken him. It's all Psalms, okay? These are all Lord Jesus is recalling Messianic Psalms. Psalm 22. All the Messianic Psalms will come here. Basically, we don't have time to look at every detail because oh, Master is now preaching two hours, you know? <laughs> so, what is happening? He's accomplishing. This is very important. Why? That's why I come from the beginning till the end, right? Prophet, priest, and king, he accomplished everything in his lifetime, in his ministry of three years. That's why we say Jesus is the true savior of the world. He accomplished and finished everything. And in fact, even his last piece clothing he has, they want to distribute, they want to take, but that also is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. The Messiah, they will auction, you know, they will 
control a lot on his garment. And all these things he just accomplished. In other words, John is telling us not that he's mentioning all the suffering. John is telling us that, yes, Jesus is fulfilling all the prophecies as the true Messiah, true Savior of the world. If we believe in his name, we will have eternal life. There is no other name. Lord Jesus accomplished once and for all. In other words, this priest, according to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, once for all, he achieved his sacrifice. Once for all, because everyone has to sacrifice year after year, they are not sure. Now, once for all, he sacrificed and accomplished. I hope all of us will be the ones who can be thankful to God, who can be thankful to Lord Jesus for his sacrifice for us. And on this Good Friday, I hope that we can really meditate on the suffering of the Lord. How much the Lord suffered to save you and me. If we understand this, you will always be very thankful. And when we proceed with the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, we can remember the suffering of the Lord. And also, it's also a reminder of his coming as well. I hope that all of us will take time to meditate on the execution of Lord Jesus, which was unfair, which was not uh, justifiable at all. So many wicked people sacrificed Lord Jesus. However, that was to save us sinners as well. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank you, we praise you, we give all the glory and honor to you for allowing us to look at this precious life of Lord Jesus. We know that Lord Jesus lived 33, about 33 years, but condensing that, that last three years was most important, but uh, not more than, no, uh, more than that, that last three days was most important, what he accomplished for us on the cross. Because you loved us so much, you suffered, you gave your own life for us, Lord. We want to thank you today. And all of us who are listening right now, and those who, are, who might be attending us, uh, joining us online, I pray that you bless them and call it, that everyone will receive abundant grace by hearing what Lord Jesus had done for us. He accomplished, he finished what he did, what you gave, the task you gave him. May we also be the ones who continue this and finish the race victoriously like Lord Jesus. Please bless everybody here. And as we begin our retreat, may your grace be upon everyone. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. <laughs>